I'm Dr. Ben Morrill. Welcome to episode two of Reptile Genetics Weekly, where we use genetics to learn more about the awesome reptiles that we're all obsessed with and love. And today I'm joined again with Kayla Short. She's here to help make sure that things are running smooth. How are you doing today, Kayla? I'm doing well. Good to be here. And we can see you this time, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Progress. We'll keep getting better. Hopefully some of our... our uh, Video is a little better this time than the last time, but we try, try um, to update a little bit after last time. So that's right. Keep getting better. But thanks for all of you. We appreciate the the questions coming in and the the views, the subscribers. Uh, it's been some some really good feedback. It's all been a lot of fun. Appreciate it, and we're excited to be here again. I know you all just saw our, our thumbnail and clicked on the video, and uh, so we decided to do a YouTube face. Yeah, we got and, the YouTuber face, got him with the crazy scientist hair and everything. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I promise you we will talk about um, some people that decided to try to make a piebald lizard. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk about how that went and uh, excited to talk about that. But uh, I, th I thought for, for this episode, what might be a good idea is to, uh, oh yeah, first of all, Kayla's mm -hmm. keeping me running straight. I got you. Uh, I yeah, I, it will be good for her to help keep me straight. I do want to do an update on samples for people. So samples that came in by April 4th, uh, we sent out results the last couple of days. So if you had, whether it's sex determination or ball python morphs, um, any of those tests, those, uh, those got sent out these last couple of days. And if yours were received after April 4th or are on the way now, uh, we'll be putting the next batch of samples together probably in a couple of weeks. And so those, those samples are, are coming in now and, and uh, I'll keep you updated when we, we do the, this show again next week, I'll, I'll let you know where, how we're looking and when the next results will be coming through. Sounds um, good. Yes. So the other thing that I thought would be good is for us to introduce ourselves really briefly, briefly, just take a couple of minutes each. So you know a little bit about, why in the world we're playing with reptiles and why we're making this show. Yeah, let's get it started. So first I'll, I'll, I'll talk about me. Um, I am Kayla Short. I'm from Southwest Virginia, uh, born and raised here. Uh, I went to um, a local university and I was actually had a background in music uh, and education. So there's me, trumpet was my main instrument for a while and I did a lot with education and ended up doing a lot more from food service to warehouse work. There's a picture of me up like 30 feet up in the air doing some inventory work in a warehouse. And, uh, but I ended up finding among all my other experiences that I really appreciate and love wildlife and herps, especially got into herping and, you know, found some life or black rats and Northern water snakes uh, with friends and, Eventually, I ended up keeping my own herps. Uh, right now, I have seven. So I have four black rat snakes uh, and two western or plains hognose snakes. So they're, they're my babies. And uh, at some point, I also found myself, uh, well, uh, making friends with Ben and getting involved with rare genetics. And now I'm uh, suddenly helping out with their uh, social media. So here we are. And as we were planning to do these short introductions, I was thinking how we ended up talking the first time. Was it a question about the sex determination test? It was actually for one of my, uh, for one of my black rat snakes, Clover, who uh, okay. actually, if you look in my background, this one, the white side with like the <laughs> white and gray, All that right. girl, uh, <laughs> she was the one. And um, I also got to talking about the yellow snake right there. Uh, and ask, I had some questions about like whether you could test whether some, an animal was T positive or not. And uh, realized that you live 20 minutes away. So we got to chatting. I came and visited your collection and well, a couple years later, here we are. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> so what about you? So for me, um, like many of you watching this, I would imagine I started off ever since I was a kid catching snakes and lizards and frogs outside whenever I could. I remember one day uh, I came home with 22 garter snakes that we had caught in about a two hour period. And my mom told me to go right back and put them where I got them. 
Um, <laughs> there's a canal not far from my house. I was probably in fourth or fifth grade. Um, and I was so happy to find that many snakes in one day. Um, but yeah, so this, <laughs> is, uh, yeah, uh, it's just always been that way uh, that I've loved them. This picture here, uh, this is as a undergrad in college was doing some field research. So this is a, a little horned lizard friend. And then uh, the next picture we got is, is me with a really beautiful black blacktail rattlesnake. Uh, this, so this was in Arizona. Um, so I had the opportunity as a as a college student to do some research as well. Um, this this field research you see pictures here, but then also to get some molecular biology experience and do some work uh, with the DNA in the lab. So that was a really good experience. And as a grad student, I had the opportunity to do a dissertation on the quantitative genetic traits, reproductive traits in ball pythons. So I worked with Dan and Colette Sutherland of the Snake Keeper. And uh, analyzed, I think it was about 10,000 eggs. Uh, Colette had kept extremely detailed information, the length, width, and weight of every individual egg, uh, which ones hatched first on any of the clutches she could, you know, she was able to notate it, um, which of the eggs hatched first versus last, and just That's all cool. kinds of information. Uh, I remember talking with them. Dan was saying, you know, what takes most other keepers five or 10 minutes to set up a clutch of eggs? Colette is taking you 45 minutes. Come on now. And she did that for year after year after year. And <laughs> I had a huge, huge pa uh, sta a stack of hard copy records. It was really cool to be able to go through that and, and learn some about uh, what reproductive traits in ball pythons are heritable. So that was pretty fun. Yeah. And after my dissertation, I ended up moving. So I, I did my uh, dissertation at Utah State University and I moved to Virginia where I worked at Revivacor. And so with Revivacor and uh, our parent company is United Therapeutics. Uh, what I was doing there was using CRISPR edits to make the pig genome, uh, the immune system specifically more like the human immune system so that the organs in the pig could be used in human transplants. And so not this last January, but the one before. So I guess coming up on being a year and a half ago, um, there was a, a, the first transplant of a CRISPR edited uh, animal organ. So this is called xenotransplantation that was put into a human. So that was pretty cool to see uh, an animal that I helped do the genetic edits on end up having the heart from that pig go into a, a human and was a pretty pretty cool experience um yeah. but you know that patient's still alive and still still kicking around so he yeah it's it was a very very interesting there's a lot of detail um mm -hmm. so but to to sum it up he had he was extremely sick and so he had been on ecmo he had been on essentially you know kind of life support machines mm -hmm. breathing and and pump, pumping pumping blood for him for like 40 or 50 days Wow. Um, and he wasn't able to get a human donation or a mechanical heart. Uh, this was really oh, no. his only option was either to, you know, just go forward with how he was and not have much time left or to give this a try. And he and his family both decided that they wanted to be able to provide this opportunity for science to be able to learn some and, and make some yeah. progress. And, so we were able to have that organ. Didn't didn't seem like it was direct rejection of the organ that that led to him passing away, but it was two months that he had wow. the the pig organ in, and it worked. He got to see the Super Bowl with his family and sing the oh, national cool. video of him singing the national anthem. I think it was the Super Bowl. I'm pretty sure Super yeah. Bowl or, or the World Series, but I think it was the Super Bowl. But anyway, that's um, a great was, leap for science, and he yes got to have that extra time because of it. That's awesome. There's lots of medical researchers still pouring over the data that came from that experiment. So very pretty, cool. Pretty cool. But yeah. um, over since 2011, when I when I met uh, Sean Christian uh, and we started talking about making a company where we could provide genetic tests in reptiles mm -hmm. um, here recently, as many of you know, I was able to quit that job. And now I'm 100 percent doing reptile stuff, whether it's breeding snakes or uh, doing DNA work, I'm able to focus on this 100%, which is really, really cool. It's the dream come true. For real. Yes. Uh, so I think we've got some uh, audience Q&As coming up next. 
All right, let's do it. Okay. So first one is from RR on Facebook. Say you find a really dirty shed uh, first thing in the morning. Is it best practice and okay to wash it with tap water before drying? All right. So this is a great question. And uh, this is from a keeper. Just he, he said that he'd kind of prefer to be more anonymous, but I figured I'd put RR. Some people might figure out who that is. He's been keeping longer than I have. Um, so he's been keeping since the, the 90s, which is pretty cool. Um, so shout out RR. Thanks for your questions. Um, so this is a good question for, for any of you that want to be able to collect sheds for genetic tests and whether it's for tests right now, or whether you want to save sheds, I would suggest you collect sheds from, from every animal you have in your collection, even if you're not going to send it in for a test right now, uh, these sheds, as long as you collect them properly, stay good for years, even at room temperature. So you could literally put each shed in an envelope and put it in a filing cabinet, or you can put them in Ziploc bags and, you know, file them away somehow. And three years from now, if we have a test that, that is, you know, helpful for a species or a specific individual reptile you have, and you've already got the shed there. And, and so, you know, I, I would say collect these sheds up. Um, so when you go to collect the shed, going along with what the, the question here is, uh, if you did come in and let's say you're checking every morning and night, so you know it's been less than 12 hours since the shed uh, came off, the skin was shed, um, what you want to do is, is take that shed out. And unless it's all in the water bowl and it's like falling apart, if it's something like that, just throw it away and wait for the next one. Um, but as long as it's not all in the water bowl and falling apart, as long as at least part of it's out, uh, what you want to do is, is find a clean and uh, as dry as you know, possible from, from what you have to work with. Take that. And if it's a juvenile or, or large animal, we really only need about a quarter size piece. Um, so what I do a lot of the time when I have a, a snake shed, I'll pull the shed out and I'll, I'll stretch it out and then I'll go about mid body and I'll, I'll rip about an inch long. So I get ventral scale, the, the belly scales and the back scales for about an inch. And then from that, uh, that small bit, that's the cleanest and the driest that you can get. You could go take that over if it's, you know, maybe it's got some of your bedding mixed in with it or something like that. Um, you can go over to the tap and use tap water and, and your hands just kind of rub and get, get all the, the chunks of anything else that might be in there with the shed, get that all washed out. And that's completely fine. As long as the shed's only wet for a, sh a short amount of time, that's no problem at all. So go ahead and wash it off and then put it in a dry area for a day or two. Just let it completely dry, should be 100% dry before you put it in a Ziploc bag to send in for, for testing. Or like I said, if you're gonna keep it in a Ziploc bag for the future, you don't wanna put it in a Ziploc bag still kind of wet. Um, that's the good thing about envelopes is you could take the shed and just put it directly into an envelope and the envelope, what that allows it to do is to still dry. And so as long as that envelope was stored in a room that's, you know, comfortable for a human to be in, not, not high humidity or wet, and then that, that shed will continue to dry and then stay dry until the time, whether it's a week later or a year later or five years later, um, you can send that shed in for genetic testing. Sounds good. So our next question is also from RR. Any risk of the first shed being contaminated with mom's genetic material from two months in the egg? I wash babies right out of the egg, but maybe some feel that isn't a good idea. So good question. I've definitely had lots of people ask about first sheds from babies. Uh, so with first sheds from babies, I'm actually not concerned about contamination from the mom. And the reason why is because, especially if you're doing artificial incubation, which is a pretty high percentage of uh, at least ball python breeders, where a lot of our samples are coming from right now. But if, uh, if the mom laid the eggs and they're not with the mom anymore and haven't been for two months, any of her DNA, especially if they're being incubated in high humidity, which is what normally happens, um, her DNA is going to be degraded and gone. So you don't have to be concerned with that. Um, but if it was like, boa, you know, some live birth like boas um, where they were just born, even then uh, you go ahead and rinse them off, set them up. Um, 
the the number one thing that I would be concerned about is that uh, I I know at least for me for many times I would keep babies really with really high humidity a lot of the time I would keep them on paper towels and just soak the paper towels and make sure that's wet in there the majority of the day and so what you wouldn't want is to have a baby shed in that wet of an environment and have it sit there for six or eight or ten hours before you find it then that shed might already be degraded and then also you have to keep in mind if you're going to take the first shed you can't let your your babies go to their first shed all in the same um, cage so once you see the first one start to go blue you're going to need to split them up and give them numbers so that once they start shedding, then you can, you know, for sure which shed goes with which individual. Yeah. As long as you don't let them get wet or stay wet for very long and you make sure you have them separated before they start shedding. So, you know, which sheds go with which animals. Um, Yeah. First sheds work great. I've done that with, with some of my ball pythons, um, you know, where a mom is a, is a het or a normal and they're bred to, you know, a pied or a clown. And I haven't seen any problem with, with cross-contamination from the mom. And with a ball python specifically, it's really fairly rare that we have uh, quality problems. Some species like Western hog noses and um, also thamnophus, so garter snakes. uh, It seems like some of the species, uh, I don't know if it's because they hang out in their water more or the type of, of substrate people keep them on, but some of the species are a little more finicky. So if you can just really pay attention, if it's one you you're, there's a high priority for you to be able to send in for testing. Uh, if you, when their eyes go blue and then start to pick her up and you know, it's within a couple of days, they're going to shed. I would either take the water bowl out just for that day or two, or if you have it in there, just have a barely enough water to cover the bottom. So that's really the the only thing that's going to mess up that shed um, other oh, than, yeah. I guess, a really diarrhea mess. But other than that, uh, you just don't want it to be wet or dirty. OK, uh, so we had some technical issues like you. It, it kind of like spaced out your voice a little bit. So you said to separate them out or maybe pull out the water dish while like after they come out of blue and you know they're about to shed. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Just making sure yeah, I, it, I, I heard it, but I wanted to clarify for the audience just in case. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. 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 Be able to pull that out. Or if you do leave it in only have barely enough water in the bottom to cover the bottom. Mm-hmm. And that way it's less likely you'll end up with a shed sitting in, in water uh, enough to destroy it. Sounds good. Thank you for answering that. So our next question is from Kyle Krill on Facebook. He says, once you've identified where a bunch of these mutations occur, could you use something like CRISPR-Cas9 or guide RNA to make hets, basically, uh, getting a snake with the exact morphs you want? So like designer morphs with CRISPR. All right. So thank you for the question, Kyle. So this is what led to the thumbnail. Yep. So you all have clicked on that. Um, So this is a, a really cool collection of information uh, that kind of led from uh, academic researchers working together with uh, keepers, with uh, commercial breeders and, and some of the material that's, that's gone towards this kind of a project has come from, from uh, you know, many keepers across the U.S. and, and in Canada. And uh, for me personally, with my background, starting out loving the animals and learning how to keep them and breed them, And then going into academics, one thing that's been difficult for me is to see times when academic people will say, well, what could I possibly learn from breeders and keepers or zookeepers? Uh, They they just have them in a a fake environment. It's not a wild animal anymore. What could I learn? And I always hated that. I always knew that there's definitely lots we can learn from breeders, especially breeders that have kept these animals for for decades. There's all kinds of behavioral and and sure, maybe it's not in a wild environment, but there's still really cool things you can learn. And then on the flip side, too, I've talked to breeders that say they don't want to hear what the people in suits have to say. And um, so for me, a a big a big thing I would like to see change is people's attitudes towards, you know, keepers towards academics and academics towards keepers and breeders. 
Um, I, I really loved seeing this work go on because uh, the, the work to be able to learn about color and pattern genetics in vertebrates. So snakes are among vertebrate animals, vertebrates in general, which includes us. Um, so that the genetics behind color and pattern, um, we're able to learn from, from these captive bred ball pythons, which is what has been focused on recently, but we'll hopefully see more and more of this, but this yeah. is really exciting and cool because finally get to see some more academics working together with, with keepers and breeders. Definitely. So the first step towards this, uh, piebald lizard effort, um, this came uh, a few years back in 2019 was when it was published. Uh, but a group in Georgia used CRISPR to make an edit so that they made an albino anole. So they were successful in using CRISPR to make a change, uh, make a, a DNA change in the animal, in an embryo. And then that embryo was born and, and was albino. So that's pretty cool, pretty exciting. They did use CRISPR to design and, and make a, a morph in a reptile. And then another step along the way to this, this thumbnail that we got for y'all uh, is that there's a group in Canada that was able to map the ball python pied mutation. And so in being able to figure this out, they work directly with breeders uh, in the United States mostly, or in Canada mostly, but they did refer to uh, the breeding data from Canova. And so they said that they looked at breeding data from 2008 to 2018 and they analyzed that. So they went through, you know, very carefully and did the math and made sure their, their question going into this is, okay, ball python breeders are saying this is a recessive trait, simple Mendelian single gene uh, trait. So is that really true? Can we look at breeding records and see that? And so in the, in these pictures here, the first one on the left, uh, that's showing out of 311 pairings where a piebald was bred to a normal or non-piebald, non-het, um, there were zero animals born that were piebald. So we, that's what we would expect as breeders. You would make all hets that look normal. And the second picture is a het piebald to a het piebald. And so once again, we as breeders would expect if we breed a het pied to a het pied that we'd get about a fourth of them being pied. And you can see here, they got a little lucky on the odds and got 26.1%. And that was out of, you know, over 200 animals, between 200 and 250 animals uh, that were produced from het to het breedings. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty much right on the, the odds we would expect. And then when they did, they reviewed piebald to a het piebald cross from Canova breedings. Um, they were able to see 48.5% of the animals from that were pied. So they were a tiny bit below the, the odds on that, but pretty much right on half mm -hmm. and half. So, so they were able to, uh, with these large numbers, like this last piebald, the het piebald crossings, that's, that's almost 500 animals that they looked at. So it's very convincing evidence from a, an academic standpoint. This is a, a single recessive trait. And so there are also some other commercial breeders, and these are the ones that were in Canada, um, so that they didn't have to worry about CITES permits and things like that. They got, got sheds from keepers and breeders in Canada. So Mutation Creation, T. Exotics, the Ballroom Canada, and Designing Morphs uh, sent in sheds from pieds and then from animals that they knew did not have pied or het pied in them. So essentially for the pied gene that, that they're studying, they're either homozygous pied or normal. And so that's another cool example where the, the breeders were able to supply information or uh, material that was used to do genetics work and be able to map and find out where the piebald mutation was that, that causes pieds in, in ball pythons. So we have a group that's done CRISPR edits to make a, a morph reptile a uh, reptile containing a designed morph. And then we have a group that figured out what genetic change needs to happen to make a piebald. So those two work together, which is awesome. And this just came out. This is a recent publication. And so the, the Georgia group and the Canada group worked together and they were able to 
go to the same gene in the anole lizard. So it's called um, TFEC or TFEC. They're able to go to that same gene that causes piebald and ball pythons in the anole lizard and make an et make edits and then see what would happen. See if we can make a piebald lizard. And so a little drum roll and this is what happened. So it's maybe not exactly what we expected, but it, it's really cool to know. So if you look on the left, we have wild type. And that, so that's a normal, a normal anole. And then on the right is the mutant. So in this case, it has some genetic change to that TFEC gene that causes piebald and ball pythons. So this would be our, quote, in quotes, piebald li anole lizard. Um, so if you look, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look closely, you can see some arrows there that point this out. But on the, in the mutant that with the TFEC mutation, uh, that anole on the snout and then the arms and legs, it's, it's white. So it's definitely a decrease in color in the snout, legs, and arms. And then the researchers also pointed out, and if you, if you find this paper online and look closer at the pictures, you can see it as well. But the skin is also more translucent in these um, TFEC mutant anole lizards. So I wouldn't necessarily call them piebald. It looks a little bit more like a hypo than it does a pied. Um, mm. But, you know, that you don't know until you try. And so that's pretty cool that they, they did that. So if we kind of, you know, look back at the bigger picture and look at what we learned from this, it's pretty cool for the average person to be able to understand that even if you make the same, you know, changes in the same gene in one animal, it's not necessarily going to be the exact same thing that, that the same outcome in another animal, the cells and the, the, we call it genetic machinery. So these proteins that do things with the DNA, how they interact. And some of you may have heard of gene expression, how genes are expressed. That's different in different animals. And so in ball pythons, um, we can see that that mutation in that TFEC gene, we get big patches of white. So that's, that's interesting. And we make a mutation in that exact same gene in an anole lizard, and we get a decrease in coloration in the snout, arms, and legs, and then some somewhat translucent skin. So that's pretty cool. It's, it makes a difference in color slash pattern, but it's different. And then if you go into the, and they talk about this in the paper, if you go into the mouse literature and you look at scientific papers about color and pattern in mice, uh, researchers actually looked at this. If, if the TFEC gene is mutated in mice, what happens? And interestingly, there's nothing that happens. <laughs> there's absolutely no reported changes uh, in color or pattern when there are mutations in that exact same so like I said, this is the exact same gene. Ball python, big patches of white. Anole lizard, you have kind of a hypo. You have less coloration, especially in the snout, arms, and legs. And then in a mouse, you mutate that same gene, no change to color and pattern. Mm -hmm. So I think that's helpful because a lot of the time, the, the mainstream media will make it kind of seem like the, with all this CRISPR stuff going on, it's so easy. You can do this, do that. And there's all this speculation about what it's going to be like in five years or 10 years or 20 years with all the CRISPR that we can do. Um, so this is a good explanation that, that or a good example of, yes, CRISPR can be used to make edits and can do cool things. But at the same time, we have a lot to learn. Even if you do an edit, you think you know how it works in one animal, you do it in another, you might not get that. And then also how you do the CRISPR edits is different in different species because how they reproduce is different. So the surgery, the way that they did this in the anole lizard, you couldn't do that in a snake that, that I know of. You'd have to you modify it quite a bit. Sure. And so it's, it's not a super simple thing, but um, as an idea in Kyle's original question, uh, theoretically, at some point, that could be an option where you could, and people have talked about that in humans as well, if you can have designer babies, you can decide what color their eyes are going to be and you can make sure they don't have any genetic, um, you know, detrimental mutations that are going to make the, the baby sick or whatever. You can go through and make sure everything's clean genetically and choose their hair color, all that kind of stuff. Um, so 
theoretically at some point that may be possible, but it's, it is very complicated to do something new, especially in a new species uh, with CRISPRs. And so it's a long ways to go, but definitely a really cool question. Thank you, Kyle. I, I wouldn't have thought about bringing this up on my own. So I'm really glad that, that you sent that question in and, and please all of you keep sending questions in. We'll, we'll keep covering them in following episodes. And Kayla and I have already made a commitment. Um, Kayla even went to part-time with her job so that we can have so a, a chunk of time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <reptile>. glad. <laughs> More reptile stuff. That's what we like. Yes. So now uh, we, we uh, have committed, we're going to do this every week for a year. And yeah. uh, I would imagine we'll keep going from there, but we will be back again next week. Um, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Like I said, thank you for sending in questions. Uh, that's really how we come up with the content for this is what you all are interested in. Um, and please do like, share, um, subscribe, and comment below. Uh, give us comments. Give us more questions. Like I said that seven times, but that's really what we, we love to see is, is what people are thinking about and what questions yeah. they have. And uh, you can certainly follow us, Facebook, Instagram. Um, is there anything else, Kayla? No, I think that'll do us. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching and definitely give us feedback. Let us know what you want to see, what questions you have. Uh, we have a little a little backlog of questions like ready to roll. So we're going to keep them and save them. That's part of my job. <laughs> so Yes, we'll keep at right. it. We'll be back again next week. See y'all then. And outro.